and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the first in a series of programs focusing on wellness. Uh, this is a series brought to you by, of course, Adith Israel, together with Beth Tikva and Beth David, as well as Beth Emmeth. And these are four phenomenal shuls here in the city of Toronto. And we're just grateful that we're able to be together. I, whether it's in person, that's great, or on Zoom, we'll take that too. Especially because it makes bringing our special guests so much easier. And it is absolutely my pleasure to welcome my friend, Rabbi Dr. Jenny Solomon, who is joining us all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Rabbi Solomon is the Director of Spiritual Engagement at Beth Mayer Synagogue. Uh, having attended Brown University and receiving her doctorate from the Postgraduate Center for Mental Health in New York City, uh, Rabbi Solomon also has rabbinic coordination from HUCJIR. She is the founding director of uh, Libi Air, the community mikvah in Raleigh, and has done tremendous work there uh, with respect to community mikvah usage and education. Uh, this is, by the way, a project we are working on here in Toronto as well, building a truly community-wide mikvah. And um, if you want to hear more about that, and especially if you want to donate money to build that, please find me a little bit later. There are tremendous qualities of Rabbi Solomon I just want to tell you a little bit about. She is a fantastic uh, rabbi, educator, leader of creative Jewish prayer and ritual. I think she's recorded a couple of different music albums. Uh, but most importantly, aside from her husband, Eric, who's also a rabbi at that shul and another good friend of mine, she has a phenomenal and gorgeous family. So without further ado, here's my good friend, Rabbi Dr. Jenny Solomon. Thank you so much, Rabbi Cutler. And thank you to this amazing um, just combination of communities that have come together uh, to support one another through what has been an incredibly challenging time. Um, and I just extend so much love and compassion. I know that uh, living in the States, we're a little bit further along in the journey and you are just um, hanging in there. And hopefully the, the next phase is soon uh, around the corner. So I'm really, it's a joy for me to be a part of this wellness series and just to see if I can offer you some of the tools that I've been using in particular uh, through this last year and a half to cope. And so one of the, I have lots of buckets, no surprise as a rabbi, uh, but I have lots of buckets of spiritual practice that are supportive to me in an ongoing way. And one of those buckets is mindfulness meditation. So there are all kinds of mindfulness meditation practices, and perhaps you are already familiar um, with some, or you're regularly practicing meditation. One of the things that I love about meditation is that we always come to it with a sense of beginner's mind. So even if you've been practicing meditation um, your entire life, you've never breathed this breath. You've never met this moment before. So we're all learning and we bring with it um, a quality of curiosity, um, heat lam dut, a kind of learner's stance every time we come together to sit. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about mindfulness just so I have a, you have a sense of where I'm coming from. And then talk about why mindfulness meditation in particular, some of the central tenets of mindfulness meditation why they, why and how they can be helpful and supportive. And then um, most importantly, we're gonna have an opportunity to practice together. So I hope that our practice will be helpful and supportive here in this moment, wherever we find ourselves. And that um, I'll send you away with a, um, a PDF of the meditations that we're gonna do. So you have the text. And, um, and that hopefully there are things that you can practice on your own as you go forth. All right. So when I think about mindfulness, I kind of like to boil it down to a very simple set of instructions. And that is pay attention. So paying attention for most of us is not necessarily difficult, although sometimes it can be. Um, we do it all the time. 
but we rarely do it with a quality of um, compassion and intentional awareness. So we really, not only are we paying attention, but we know we're paying attention and we're paying attention with a kind of warmth, a quality of chesed, of loving kindness towards our experience. And like everything else um, in life that we want to become um, more grounded in and aware of, it's something that we practice. Um, which is also something that I love about mindfulness meditation. It's not something that um, anyone can ever really master or you get a good grade in. Um, there are no good meditators or bad meditators. We just practice. We practice. So practicing for me has become extremely, extremely important during this pandemic. Why? Um, for somewhat obvious reasons, the pandemic has brought about all kinds of difficult feelings. Now, as human beings, we always are forced to encounter difficult feelings. That's just part of the human experience. All of us meet suffering. We meet situations that bring about disappointment and anger. Um, but it feels like this pandemic has been an, a kind of intensification and um, marathon or ultra marathon experience in some of the more difficult feelings and experiences of life. So I'm curious, we'll use the chat for just a moment. And if you just want to put into the chat, um, you can just list out, you know, with one word, some difficult feelings or states of being that have been really consistent during this time. So let's just take a moment, feel free to add something, one word in the chat, a feeling or a state of being that has been really challenging. Fear, in a rut, anxious, sadness, anxiety, overwhelmed, lonely, isolation, exhaustion, frustration, isolation, stress, crying. Yes, yes. All of these things, all of these things, um, guilt, lousy time to look for a house or an apartment and move. Oh my goodness. Yes. Lonely. Yeah, absolutely. So there are more things coming. Helplessness, right? Right. Lack of control. So mindfulness, um, by offering us um, a, a moment or an experience or a period of time, a practice in which to expand our quality of loving awareness um, can help us be less reactive to some of these states of being and more responsive. So I don't know about you, but I know for myself, for example, when I'm feeling bored or sad or helpless, um, if I'm not being particularly aware or particularly loving towards myself, I could find myself um, eating when I'm not hungry or falling down a rabbit hole of social media. Um, I'm sure you have your own things that you could easily slip into. Totally natural. We all, we all do this. So what happens is that when we instead engage in practice of mindfulness, we can identify what it is we're feeling with a little bit greater ease, orient ourselves towards that experience with some compassion, and then step back with a bit of space, kind of hold it in a larger frame, and think about what the most adaptive, most wholesome, most supportive response might be. Okay. That was my spiel about mindfulness. Now I wanna talk about some basic principles that are really at the core of how I think about Jewish meditation. So the first is that there is no mind without a body and no body without a mind. So Judaism is a practice of wholeness, right? I think that um, sometimes we attribute that idea that only like, uh, Eastern, East Asian religions have this sort of mind-body connection, but I, I believe with all my heart that it is very much indigenous to Jewish wisdom. Um, and so we're one, we're one being. And so when we um, 
when we kind of have an awareness that our body and soul go together, when we're doing mindfulness practice, that is an embodied experience. When we're doing an embodied experience, that is uh, a mindfulness experience. We are, we're bearing witness to the fact that we are in fact whole, that we're not separate pieces. We're one, um, one living organism. So that's the first thing, practicing our wholeness, our own sense of oneness, mind and body always together, inextricably connected. The second is that mindfulness is really about practicing presence. So what do I mean by presence? Um, I imagine you've had experiences, um, perhaps with your amazing rabbis and educators, um, people, good friends, people who know how to um, show up and listen with curiosity and benevolence, um, people who, when you're in a difficult place, uh, don't turn the other way, but instead sort of incline themselves towards you. These are different ways of thinking about presence. And in particular, I think about presence as having a spirit of non-opposition. So non-opposition, um, well, you, you know what opposition is, right? Like, uh, I'm, feeling, um, I'm feeling really sad. And so I'm going to try to push that away by binge watching a television show or, um, you know, all kinds of things that we do to kind of distract ourselves or escape. That's actually a form of opposition. We're pushing away, we're fighting, we're resisting something that is truth um, that is arising um, for us in the moment. And so when we practice presence, we're practicing being with what is happening exactly as it is. It's a kind of radical acceptance. Okay, that's a bit about presence. Two more concepts that I wanna share. The third um, is that mindfulness is about living with, with greater, a greater quality of emet and chesed. And I know that Beth Emeth is um, one of the congregations joined here tonight. So emeth is of course the Hebrew word emet, truth, honest seeing. And then chesed, chesed is loving kindness, loving awareness. So when we practice mindfulness meditation, one of the things that we're doing is sort of practicing honest seeing what is true right now, bearing witness to exactly what is happening. And then as we notice what is happening, we see if we can come flush with that experience. Um, from a place of love. And the last concept that I wanted to share is that mindfulness for me is about softening into my experience. Um, some people may even notice, um, I know for myself, I had a very tense week, maybe Rad Rabbi Cutler remembers this experience, but we had our big annual meeting. This is the meeting where like all the people come out and they vote on the rabbi's contract. <laughs> okay. It that is does not happen here. Okay. Okay. It, it doesn't work like that yet. and no one shows up for the AGM, but we're having ours this Sunday for Beth, uh, for Adit Israel. So please, um, please you can register for the next few minutes. <laughs> okay. God bless you. You're doing it much better than we are. In any case, this was, oh my goodness, so much um, tension in my body. I mean, I could feel it for weeks and days on end in all kinds of places, in my jaw, in my back, just a lot of tension. And so um, maybe you notice that from time to time, like, oh, wow, like my shoulders, they're up to my ears or, you know, my neck is sore. We're all doing a lot more sitting, a lot less moving around. So can I bring some softness, a quality of softness to my experience? And of course it is, I don't know anybody who can sort of maintain um, an ongoing quality of softness, especially under difficult circumstances, you know, without pause, that's, that's not possible. But with mindfulness practice, we can remember. And then when we remember, see if we can practice softening into our experience. Okay.
So one of the central mindfulness meditation practices is called sitting. And again, I know you all are an incredibly knowledgeable and wise group. So many of you may have um, a little or even a lot of experience with meditation, with seated meditation, with sitting. Um, but since I know we're not all coming from the same place, I'm going to, um, I hope you'll, um, be generous in giving me a moment just to describe some of the basics so that we can sort of all begin together. So first, as we think about seated meditation, it's really good to know that, um, that our minds are busy, like all of our minds are busy. Um, whenever I start teaching a new meditation group, uh, there are always people in the group that say, um, I, I'd love to do meditation. I've tried a bunch of times, but I'm terrible. My mind is always busy. So I'm going to let you in on a little secret. All of our minds are busy. <laughs> That's what they do. They think that is their job. So if your mind is busy and it jumps from thing to thing, and you might've heard of the idea of like monkey mind, just know you're human. Um, and that all of us have brains and minds that do this very thing. And so one of the things that we do in meditation to help bring about concentration and focus um, is to have some particular object or set of words um, so that we can help bring our attention to that object or set of words over and over again. Now I'm just going to reiterate, even if you have an anchor like your breath or a set of words, know that your mind will wander. It, it, it really will wander. Sometimes it only takes 10 seconds. Um, that is part of the experience. And again, the question becomes, when you notice that your mind has wandered, can you bring your mind back to your intended um, object of focus from a place of love? So, you know, there you go again, bad meditator. You'll never be able to do this. That is not the voice <laughs> that we're trying to cultivate here, but rather, oh, mind wandered, coming back to the breath with love. Okay. So the last thing that I want to say before we, we get started in, in some practice um, is that I like to think about this practice a little bit like stepping onto Noah's Ark. So you may remember, we're, of course, um, much further on in the Torah cycle now, but if you can remember back to Parashat Noah, um, one of the things, Noah, Noah is commanded, that you're to make for yourself an ark. And so when I think about the quality of my sitting practice, I think about it a little bit like stepping onto an ark. It's like stepping onto a place um, that is a refuge. An ark, um, unlike a motorboat, doesn't have a GPS system. It doesn't have a rudder. It doesn't have a motor. It invites us to just take some time to float with a kind of faithfulness. And you may even remember that there is this very unique word describing the ark, that the ark is to have a tzohar, which is one of those very unique words that we don't totally know what it means, but the medieval commentators thought about it as a kind of little window. And this is also an important part of my practice because I don't practice meditation so that I can remove myself from the world. That is not the kind of meditation that I do. I practice um, seated meditation so that I can live um, with more love and more caring and kindness and a quality of peacefulness uh, in the world as it is with, with the people that I'm connected to um, exactly where I am. And so when I think about being on that ark, I, it's important for me to remember that I don't step onto the ark losing connection from, from my life exactly as it is. All right. So we're going to begin practicing and um, the most important thing as we get started is to find a good seat. So in meditation, that 
Um, you don't have to have a special chair. You don't have to sit on the floor in a cross-legged position. Thank God <laughs> we don't have to do um, bend ourselves into a pretzel. You really just need to find um, a seat where you can feel supported and comfortable. And so when we sit in meditation, we want to sort of strike this balance between feeling both calm and alert. Um, so being in a supported seat where we're comfortable and we can sort of sit in a dignified way, but if you have fidgets, if something doesn't feel right, if you need an extra pillow, it's a good idea to get that into place. So as we sit here, and I'm gonna guide you every step of the way, um, we're, we're not trying to do anything per se. So it's not, you may have this question like, am I doing it right? What am I supposed to be feeling? You can release all of that. Um, this is really about practicing a certain state of being. So you can maybe even think about us, remind, remember that we are human beings, that meditation is a practice in which we practice our being. So we're not trying to achieve anything at all. So I'm gonna invite you to get into your good seat, make any adjustments that you need and begin by, um, if you feel comfortable, uh, allowing your eyes to close. And if that feels uncomfortable for any reason, you can allow them to just, um, your gaze to, to soften. You can keep your eyes at half mast. But if you allow your eyes to close, it just helps um, calm the nervous system and sort of um, turn down the volume on all the external stimulus. I wanna invite you to just take a nice deep breath. But take a moment to notice the connection that your feet are making with the ground. So really sensing that point of connection between us and the earth, the earth rising up to meet us, to hold us close, to keep us tethered. And now bring some attention to your hands. They may have naturally sort of fall in comfortably on your lap, palms down. You might experiment with what it feels like to have your palms facing up, sort of posture of receptivity. Or you may even kind of cradle them, holding one hand and the other in front of you that might feel very supportive and loving. There's no right or wrong way to position your hands, but just take a moment to notice what feels good and right in this moment. And as you continue to take a couple of deep breaths, take a moment to notice if there is any kind of holding or tension in the body. And oftentimes I'm completely unaware until I check in. So take a moment to note your forehead, jaw, cheeks, neck, shoulders, upper back, lower back. belly, and as you scan the body, see if you can take some deep breaths that actually bring about a quality of softness. 
a quality of non-opposition, no need to brace for impact. Just radical presence here and now. And we're gonna do a very basic meditation practice using two words. On the inhale, we're gonna breathe in hineni, which means here I am. It's a word which expresses that very quality of presence. Here I am with all of my wholeness, with my, my fear and my anxiety and my sadness and my guilt and my helplessness and my joy and my relief and my everything. Here I am, Hineni. And as you breathe out, Toda, thank you for this moment, this breath, this life, this awareness. So we breathe in Hineni. Breathing out Toda. And just hear the words in your mind's eye. You don't actually have to say them. Breathing in, Hineni. Breathing out, Toda. Thank you. Breathing in, Hineni. Breathing out, Toda. Breathing in, Hineni. Breathing out, Toda. Thank you. So let's take about 10 more cycles at your own pace. And when you're done, we'll come together with the sound of my voice. Beautiful, so take just one more round wherever you are. And when you're done, you can open your eyes. 
And just notice for a moment, notice how your body feels. Notice any shift in your state of mind. You don't have to judge it or tell a story about it, but just notice what might feel different in this moment. And if you'd like, if you wanna put into the chat, again, just one word or two words, and just share with the group, maybe something that you noticed, how you're feeling in this moment, what you remembered, calm, relaxed, calmer, calm, peaceful, slower heart rate, beautiful, relaxed, excellent, great. I feel those things too, slowed the pace, relaxed stomach, nice. I have um, somebody in my own congregation who uh, attended a meditation class that I did. Oh, I love these edges have softened. Beautiful. So relaxed. And um, I think she was a little bit skeptical of the whole thing. It wasn't totally her groove. Uh, and then a couple of weeks ago, she went to donate blood, which she hadn't done in many, many, many months since COVID began. And we held a blood drive at our shul. And uh, the person who was taking her blood was running her vitals at the beginning. And they, they said, you know, we're, we'll eventually be able to do this, but your, your heart rate is just running way too fast right now. Um, we're going to need to wait for your heart rate to come down before we can proceed. And she's like, oh, I think I'll try that <laughs> Hineni Toda meditation. And she was amazed after like three minutes, it was magical. And literally um, they came and took her stats again and it, her blood pressure was radically different. So uh, it really does, um, it does work. It's, it's very simple and it works, beautiful. Um, okay, so before we go on to the next practice, um, I was thinking a little bit about mindfulness meditation in the context of this week's Torah portion. Um, some of you are probably well aware this is Parshat Korach. So we're in the, in the part of our wandering through the wilderness. Um, Korach, who is Moshe's cousin, rises up. We don't really know much about him at all up until this point, but clearly he's been agitating. He's sort of pining for power and along with his uh, buddies kind of creates a moment of insurrection of sorts, of rebellion, hoping to, to take Moses down. So um, I'm thinking about that this week, also in, in the context of kind of like this idea that we all have our own inner Korach. And what happened with Korach is that um, the boiling point was kind of reached and overflowed. Um, also, it does not go well for Korach. As you may know, he gets swallowed up by the earth. Um, so he, he dies a, a dramatic and devastating um, death. We don't want that total moments of total destruction to come. So the question becomes kind of how can we let out some steam before we reach our boiling point? How can we lower the temperature when we notice that we're becoming really, really agitated? It is impossible to never feel agitated. It's impossible to never feel scared or afraid or lonely or helpless or sad. These are inevitable states of being. Um, on the human journey. But mindfulness meditation can help us, um, as I said, when we become aware that that's, what hap that's what's happening. See if we can turn down the volume, the temperature just a little bit so um, that we don't boil over. Okay, before we move on to the next practice, I wanna pause and just take note if there are any questions. So feel free. Um, to put a question in the chat. Are you doing it now? 
And I think there's somebody who's unmuted. So I'm assuming, uh, yeah, good. It happens to all of us from time to time. Don't worry, don't be embarrassed. So does anybody have any questions that you wanna ask in this moment? Sometimes it's hard if you save them for too long. So I like to kind of pause and see if anyone wants to ask anything right now. If anyone would like to ask anonymously, you can also send me a question and I will ask it for you. Great, perfect. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So can I just get a thumbs up if you can see? Yeah, great, perfect. Okay, so um, you'll see up at the top of this page, the meditation that we just did, Hineni, Here I Am, and Toda. And now we're gonna work with um, what I call, it's a kind of prayer practice, what I call loving kindness meditation. And there are all kinds of varieties of loving kindness meditation, but the one that I love best is um, based off of Birkata Koanim, the priestly blessing. So this is the most ancient blessing in our tradition, one we use at all kinds of important moments, some that are um, exceptional, that happen rarely, and then other ones um, that are more regular. These are the words that we use to bless our children as we enter into Shabbat on Friday night. And perhaps you have your own special connections to Birkata Kohanim, the priestly blessing as well. And so I'm gonna read through this blessing um, and add a kind of translation, which um, I believe gets at the qualities of being that this blessing is really hoping to confer. And then we'll again, find our seat close our eyes, and I'll guide you through this blessing practice, this loving kindness meditation. But it's helpful to, to kind of read the text to visually um, before we get started. So the words of the text in Hebrew, Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha, Ya'er Adonai panav elecha v'chuneka, Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. And so the translation which renders this, these qualities of being, may you feel blessed, may you feel safe. May you feel luminous, meaning may you feel filled with light or bathed with light, ya'er, with or. May you feel loved, chen. And again, this is a kind of love that is not dependent upon your behavior, whether you've been good or you've been bad. Chain is grace. It is unearned love that is of which we are all deserving. May you feel happy. May you feel peaceful. So those are the words that we're gonna use in our meditation, but I just want you to know as an alternative that there are, there are endless alternatives. Um, another one that I use that's just even shorter and simpler, um, may you feel safe, may you feel loved, may you feel at ease, very simple. And you could use Sim Shalom, um, some other, other beautiful blessings that we have in our tradition kind of as a basis, but, um, but this is what we're gonna use tonight. All right. So once again, I'm gonna invite you um, to find a good seat. I'll stop sharing for now because you don't need to look at anything. Um, and I'm just gonna invite you um, again to find a comfortable position. It might be the same position you were in before, or you might wanna make some adjustments. Maybe you even wanna stretch your body a little bit um, and move so that you can uh, settle more easily. And when you get the fidgets out and you're ready to settle, I invite you again to close your eyes or soften your gaze. And to begin with three slow, deep breaths, just in and out. And 
No need to force it or shape the breath in any way. Just breathing in and out of this moment. Take a moment to notice the connection again between your feet and the ground, between your back body and the chair, gently allowing your hands to rest wherever it feels comfortable, supported, safe, easy. Take a moment to notice if you can feel a sort of isometric pull between feeling rooted and grounded, but also lifted. Spine and crown of the head sort of gently reaching upwards. So there's this sort of root to rise quality in the body. Once you've found this beautiful seated posture, I'm gonna invite you to imagine someone in your life that you love so deeply, without qualification, without question, without condition. You don't have to think long and hard. Just imagine who that person is. Imagine them before you. And we're gonna offer them this blessing. May you feel blessed. May you feel safe. May you feel luminous. May you feel loved. May you feel peaceful. May you feel happy. Together we breathe in and out. Sealing the blessing. And now I invite you to bring to mind somebody who you like, somebody who you have a sense of affection. Maybe it's a neighbor or a friend, somebody with whom you work. May you feel blessed. May you feel safe. May you feel luminous. May you feel loved. May you feel happy. May you feel peaceful. Together we breathe in and out. Now imagine a person in your life who you might put into the category of neutral. So somebody you don't particularly like or dislike, or perhaps even know very well. Maybe it's a regular cashier at a place where you shop or crossing guard on your street. Somebody who you know and recognize, but don't know well. May you feel blessed. May you feel safe. May you feel luminous. May you feel loved. May you feel happy. 
May you feel peaceful. You breathe in and out. Now I invite you to imagine someone whom you find difficult. And I would advise you not to go looking for the most difficult person in your life, but somebody who bothers you, whether in an ongoing way or more acutely here in this moment, who you find difficult. May you feel blessed. May you feel safe. May you feel luminous. May you feel loved. May you feel happy. May you feel peaceful. Breathing in and out. And finally, we bring that blessing into our own being. We acknowledge that we cannot extend blessing to others from a place of emptiness. We must know what it is to be those things in ourselves in order to share it generously with others. So in this moment, hold yourself in blessing. May I feel blessed. May I feel safe. May I feel luminous. May I feel loved. May I feel happy. May I feel peaceful. We take a deep breath. And we now extend these blessings to all beings those we know, those we don't know, those we like, those we love, those we find difficult. May all beings feel blessed. May all beings feel safe. May all beings feel luminous. May all beings feel loved. May all beings feel happy. May all beings feel peace. Together we breathe in and out. When you feel ready, I invite you to open your eyes. And once again, just take a moment to notice uh, state of being, state of mind. Maybe again, you notice something has shifted Um, I know for myself, this blessing practice has been one of my favorite ways um, to go to bed at night, and not only because it lends itself to um, allowing myself to relax and sleep, um, because it generates a quality of generosity 
of goodness towards others. Um, it's just a really beautiful note upon which to, uh, to go to sleep, especially if I'm holding a lot of worry, which I do. Um, okay, so Shelly says sense of well being. Beautiful. Great. Anyone else want to throw anything into the chat? Something you noticed? Something you thought of? Something that surprised you? Feeling lighter? Worked for me to relax enough to fall asleep. Wonderful. I do not take offense. <laughs> I put people to sleep all the time. <laughs> if only it worked with my children. Um, it's like I'm floating. Wonderful. Great. Great. No offense to intended. Absolutely. Beautiful. Right. So even the, the words that you're using to describe are really important. I know for myself um, that when I'm feeling very stressed or worried, I will often describe that as having a sense of heaviness right? I feel weighed down. So when I do this practice, I too will have a greater sense of, um, of lightness, of levity, of sense of um, feeling lifted. So those are all great descriptions. I felt like a conduit for the blessings. They flowed through me. It feels good. Beautiful. Um, and just on that note, you know, sometimes when I feel like I'm sort of perseverating on negativity, whether it's worry or um, sadness or loss or disappointment, um, this blessing practice is a very helpful way of shifting out, um, out of that sort of train, which can just keep um, keep going and, and get into a very different kind of way of being wonderful. All right. Uh, hard not to go off on a tangent with each person that I'm focused on. Yes, <laughs> that can happen. That's why we practice. Um, it's easy to get into sort of storytelling mode uh, with each of those people. And sometimes, you know, thinking about, do I really want to do this person or that person? Or <laughs> that made me think about the, what this person did yesterday, you know? So very normal, very natural. We just practice. And the more that you practice, the easier it becomes not to fall into some of those traps. Um, helps dealing with a recent loss. Beautiful. And so this is, again, um, if you're finding yourself really thinking about somebody that you're worried about, somebody that you feel far from, that you miss very deeply, um, maybe even somebody that you've lost, um, that this can be, a, again, a very healthy, helpful, adaptive way to channel loving attention towards that person. Um, can you practice not to fall asleep? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, absolutely. And by the way, anybody who practice me practices meditation regularly, um, if they're honest, will tell you that it is totally natural to fall asleep from time to time. And one of the things that we practice when we do fall asleep, and then we realize that we've fallen asleep and we wake up is, can I come back to my practice? Um, again, from a place of loving kindness. So um, I know I was sitting with a group of people on Wednesday, that was yesterday, and I fell asleep. And so the words that I heard as I woke up are like, oh, you are exhausted. Of course you fell asleep. It's okay. Just come back. Come back, sweetie. Okay. So that's the, the voice we practice hearing, not other sort of more punitive Pharaoh voices, which I am also very familiar with. Uh, seriously, what focus on what person? I'll watch the video. Okay. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what you're asking here, but um, it's, it's not super critical um, kind of which person you choose. It, in some ways, it's, it's kind of random and that's okay. We're just finding real people, real um, humans with whom we interact, who we can sort of serve as, um, as objects of our generosity and love. 
All right. I want to take a couple minutes. I'm going to share my screen again to um, offer you a couple of resources that, um, that I find really supportive in, in the event that you're interested. So the first is that um, I am uh, serve as sort of ongoing adjunct faculty for the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, um, which is based in the US, but absolutely serves um, not only the North American Jewish community, but um, people all over the world and including in Israel. And um, we have a daily sit Monday through Friday from 1230 to one, which is taught by a rotating group of rabbis and teachers. Um, it, it's sort of a little bit like what we did tonight, but much shorter. So there will be about 10 minutes of instruction, spoken instruction, and then about 15 minutes of practice and about five minutes to, um, we say Kaddish, mourners Kaddish, um, and, and say goodbye. So it's very short and, and really a beautiful experience. Um, so I invite you, and it's free. So I invite you to check that out. It's at jewishspirituality.org. You can also find the Institute for Jewish Spirituality on YouTube and Facebook, um, and the daily sits are recorded there. So you could go back, even if there are some days that 1230 to 1 doesn't fit my schedule, um, I'll try to find another time later in the day to sit with the group, um, even if it's not in real time. So that's one wonderful meditation. And I love that it's all within Jewish um, teaching. You know, it's not like I have to um, kind of make translations between other religious traditions uh, and my meditation practice. It just feels really holistic and authentic to my own soul. So the second is I have two favorite apps on my phone um, that I find helpful. If you wanna start a meditation practice, it's helpful to have a timer. Uh, and sometimes it's helpful, especially at the beginning to have some, some guided meditation. And so one that I really like is Insight Timer. And the other is called 10% Happier. So those are two, and there are lots of like whole courses built into these apps, but certainly just easy ones that you can pick out like, oh, I have five minutes, I have 10 minutes. Perfect, great. Um, so that's very helpful. Uh, and the last, there are many books on meditation, uh, Jewish meditation that I could recommend, but my number one favorite book um, was written by Rabbi Alan Liu of Blessed Memory. And he wrote the book called Be Still and Get Going, a Jewish meditation practice for real life. So Alan Liu, L-E-W, and his book is called Be Still and Get Going. All right. So right now I am going to, um, I'm gonna go to everyone and I'm gonna put in the chat, I'm gonna attach this um, file except for something's not going right. So I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> um, okay, I won't bother with it. Looks a little different than it normally does for me. But I know that the um, amazing educators and organizers and administrators who have brought us all together will send you, they have this PDF. And so they will send this to you. You'll have it as a follow-up email so that you can use these practices um, as you go forward. And I just hope that they are, um, supportive to you and helpful to you. Uh, this is, this is not, there is nothing easy about this experience that we're going through collectively. And for some of us, it is more difficult than others. So be gentle with yourselves, especially as God willing, um, we continue to phase back in to, um, whatever new normal looks like, looks like for us. You know, I was saying just before we got on this call, I was talking to Gail and Cora you know, like just taking off my mask for the first time in the grocery store, which I know you in Canada, I like can't even imagine that, but that moment will come. Uh, and it's, it's scary. It's scary. Even when the science tells us, you know, that it's safe. So be gentle. Hineni, toda. May I feel blessed. May I feel safe. These are the practices you can use while you're standing in line at the grocery store um, or when your, your head hits the pillow at night. So um, I'll just give a minute or two if anybody wants to, um, you can unmute yourself and ask a question. You can put something in the chat. If you funneled something to Cora, she can feel free to let me know. 
we'll take just a couple minutes and then we'll we'll conclude. Thank you so much, Rabbi Solomon. As, as Rabbi Solomon said, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute, and you can also send them anonymously to me. Uh, I do have an anonymous question to ask. Uh, the question is, what tips do you have if you're having a panic or anxiety attack in public and need to calm yourself down, but can't meditate? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So the first, my first go-to is the breath. Um, the breath is this amazing mechanism um, that we all have that, generally speaking, will uh, clue our nervous system to remember that we are, in fact, safe. And then once we remember that we're safe, we have, again, more space and skill to figure out the next best move. But some people find kind of hyper-focusing on your breath actually anxiety provoking. Some people do, I don't, but some people do, and that's okay. So some people find it more helpful to notice um, like ambient sound, to identify one sound in your environment to sort of bring your attention to that sound or one sensation in the body. And that might even be um, hand to heart or sometimes, um, I'll take two fingers to my wrist and just feel my heartbeat, um, just feel my pulse. Just remember my heart's beating. It may feel like it's beating out of my body, but I'm okay. So the idea is if you can bring your attention to one point of focus in the body or in your immediate environment in the present moment, um, that often has the effect of, again, just turning down the volume enough that you can make a skillful decision about how you want to proceed. Others? I do have another one uh, that came to me. Uh, there was an expression that you used. Uh, uh, the question is, is it root to rise? And what you meant by that, if you could um, expand on that. Sure. So I guess what I'm describing is... Um, if you practice yoga, uh, this will be very familiar to you, but as you sort of engage your, your roots, your core, and that could be sort of feeling that connection between your feet and the ground, could be that kind of engagement of your core, of your center, your trunk of your being. Um, when we do, when we feel that sense of rootedness and engagement, at the same time, we can also feel this kind of lift. Um, so it's, it's working sort of isometrically that pulling down again, nothing forceful, but that gentle sense that we are connected, which allows for also this greater in, enhanced capacity to kind of lift and rise. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to describe, but it's easier to feel than it is to describe. Anyone else would like to unmute or send in a question? I have one here that uh, is about when to use which meditations and how you start to decide kind of what you should be using and, and whether there's some sort of flow chart or something that can help you understand. Yeah, great question. Um, that's one of the wonderful things that starts to happen in meditation practice. And that's been my experience is that the longer I practice, um, the more I've learned to trust myself. So instead of um, sort of imposing my mental will on my body, okay, okay, right now I'm going to do Hineni Toda um, meditation. Instead, um, when I pause to practice in the midst of my day, uh, just noticing what, what is this moment calling for right now? So for example, sometimes um, if I'm in a really, really agitated state, I may need to just lie down on the floor, kind of in that corpse pose, that pose that you might do at the end of a yoga class, one hand to my heart, one hand to my belly, and just breathe. On the flip side, if I'm, you know, moving through my afternoon and I cannot keep my eyes open, that is not the meditation that I want to do. I may, um, I may sit up in a comfortable chair and do Hineni Toda. So it's really about responding to the moment. And the more that you practice, the more that you sense 
um, kind of what it is, where you want to place your attention and what, what the most skillful way to, to channel your attention um, might be. So that's, that's just a practice kind of thing. Trust yourself. Great. Thank you. Another question here is, can meditation help with decision-making and ambivalence? Um, that is my experience um, for two reasons. One is that, um, again, meditation has really helped me learn to trust my own experience, right? The noise out there that's telling me this or that or this or that you should do this way or what if I do this and then that happens, right? All the kinds of things that we can get caught up in um, hearing very loudly that gets super amplified, especially in a moment of difficult decision-making. Um, when I come back into my body, into my own breath, in the truth of my experience, I usually know the next best step. And if I miss it, then I just try again. <laughs> that happens too. Maybe one more question, anyone? There is another question. Uh, this person is saying that their mind is often distracted during prayer mm -hmm. and if, med if meditation can help with that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the same thing that happens in sort of seated meditation, like we practice tonight happens to me in tefillah too. Um, and you're not alone. Um, our great masters of prayer, our Hasidic masters, we're talking about machshavot zarot, distracted thoughts, literally for hundreds of years. So you are not alone. And um, again, you can use some of these same techniques. Um, pick two words. If you're reading a prayer um, before Shema, um, Ahava Rabba, great love. And just hold those two words, breathing in, Ahava, breathing out, Rabba. Um, Shema Yisrael can be done very beautifully on the in-breath and the out-breath. Shema in, Yisrael out, Adonai in. Eloheinu out, Adonai in, Echad out. So absolutely, we have so many words in our prayers and they're beautiful words, um, but they can often take us out of the prayer, ironically, out of the truth of our experience. So how do we bring those words in with greater awareness, greater presence, greater attention? Hope that's helpful. All Thank right. you very much. Great. I do want to turn yeah. it over to Marlene for yeah. our closing. Marlene White, thank right. you for offering to give some closing words and thanks. My pleasure. My name is Marlene White, and on behalf of Beth Ameth, Abs Israel, Beth David, and Beth Tikva, and all our guests attending this evening, I want to thank Rabbi Dr. Jenny Solomon for an insightful and informative presentation. We can all certainly identify and learn from what Rabbi Dr. Jenny Solomon has shared with us tonight. We continue to be faced with challenging times and you have given us tools to assist in getting through these times and also to flourish, which is an immense help for the future. Once again, thank you Rabbi Dr. Jenny Solomon for this wonderful, wonderful evening. I would like to remind everyone of our next program in this series, and it's entitled Reconnect the D Disconnect, Learn the Art of Conscious Communication with Terry Klein, which will take place on Tuesday, June 22nd at 7.45. Please consult your synagogue website to register. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. Stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you at our next program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Marlene. Thanks, everyone. Great to be with you. Be well, be safe.